Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm glad to have this chance to talk with you. Um, in the time since I um, wrote the abstract for this and started to work on the paper, I feel like my topic changed a little bit. If I was going to give this um, talk a title now, I think I would call it something like libidinal Bildung in Die Meistersinger. So the story of Die Meistersinger centers on the learning and application of a particular musical craft, the art of master song. Less obviously, the opera is about the value of knowing and not knowing social and psychological discipline. Indeed, Die Meistersinger can be read as a Bildungsoper, in which Walter von Stolzing develops from a naive, naturally gifted interloper into a member of a most burgerlich guild and the true match for the most eligible girl in town. Alongside Walter's development, the other leading characters, Zox, Eva, and Beckmesser, navigate their own paths to reconciliation with the ramifications, both psychological and social, of Walter's unexpected arrival on the scene. In order to become a suitable spouse for Eva, Walter must learn not only the art of proper song under the guidance of Hans Sachs, but also the norms and models of bourgeois life. In order to succeed in uniting his feelings and his social world, Walter must learn and internalize the gender constructions essential for the establishment of bourgeois identity, as well as the customs of love and sexuality involved in a society in which the ideals of marriage, eligibility, and romantic love are central. The opera makes fairly explicit analogies between the musical rules of master song, which are carefully minded by the guild, and the social rules of marriage and romantic affiliation. All that I've just said, if not merely conventional wisdom, does tread some established paths, and it does get at some of the truly important things about the cultural work that Die Meistersinger was, and perhaps still is, involved in. And much of this is expressed quite plainly and effectively through the music. Other aspects of it are articulated as well through the music, but in less overt ways. In this presentation, I will hope to show you something of how these musical articulations work and to consider how they might shed light on some of the important subtexts of the drama. The most clearly defined of the musical articulations arise from Walter's music, particularly his spring song, uh, which is his first attempt to sing a song acceptable to the guild. This recorded example, like all of them that I'll play, is from the recording led by Wolfgang Savalisch with Ben Heppner, Cheryl Studer, and Bernd Weichel. So this song that we've just heard does a number of things. It gives voice to Walter's untutored musical creativity and to his, his untrammeled desire, which he expresses in some, in some remarkably frank terms, as you can see here. This thoroughly scandalizes the, the, the Meistersingers as their violent reaction to the music shows, both because of its unabashed text and its flagrant violations of their musical rules. It also gives voice to what proves to be one of the most important musical motifs in the opera. Let me see, I think I'm... Yeah, so let me, let me play the pertinent passage for you. And, and note, in particular, the important, if not yet well-marked, interval of the diminished fourth, which I've, I've boxed the most important one there in the double box, and then there's a, a secondary one, I guess, that is outlined there as well. So let me just play this again so you can hear. Oops.
Following Walter's song, the next stages of this story involve Hans Sachs, who, as the wise man of the group, immediately senses something significant happening here in this song. And at the very end of the first act, amid the tumult on stage and in the music, for one very stagey moment, a fragment of Walter's song is sounded in dramatic fashion, spotlighted, complete with little flourishes from the harp. As both the stage direction and the action on stage reveal, this music brings us for a moment into Zox's mind. The situation surrounding Walter and all it portends has come to preoccupy him. And early in the, in the second act, the following act, in his great fleet air monologue, Sox ponders what he's just witnessed and experienced. And in the orchestral uh, background, this motif is sounded several times. And then eventually, through the course of his pondering, Sox eventually brings this idea to conscious expression, and he sings the motif out, and in the process gives it words. And here is that moment. This, this moment is both powerful and symbolic. For the first time, it openly identifies the pivotal element in the psychology of the opera, namely this almost non, unnameable impulse that informs so much of what happens. Here, it is identified provisionally as lensis gebot, spring's command. Later, in its negative manifestations, Sachs tabs it as van. Following Schopenhauer, we might relate this impulse to the will or to Freud's notion of libido. But whatever we call it, it is a potent force striving and activating, but without a definite object, something that drives much that if not, if not all of human behavior, sexuality, of course, but also creativity, aggression, and much else. It is, I submit, the mainspring of the psychological and social drama that animates the plot of Die Meistersinger. In fact, the opera can be read very meaningfully as a parable about the power of this non-rational force of desire and the need to position oneself properly with respect to it, both psychologically and socially. The meaningful connections in this process are supported as much by, as by music as by the overt dramatic representation. Musically, the key figure is the interval of the diminished fourth. The interval, which we have just seen, is an essential element in several of the most prominent themes in the opera, in Walter's Spring Song and then in this Lenses Gebot motif. And thus it comes to serve as an adaptable symbol of libidinal impulses. And in this way, the music creates connections that are not entirely encompassed by the leitmotif system as it is commonly understood, but rather to adapt a term introduced by Carl Dahlhaus, they work at a, this interval works at a sub-motivic level. It involves the components of motifs, not complete motifs themselves, atoms rather than molecules, perhaps. The, this wider role of the diminished fourth weaves a web of what Thomas Mann memorably called Wagner's Beziehungszauber, his magic of illusion. Claude Levi Strauss famously argued that in the ring cycle, Wagner carries out a structural analysis of myth through music. By making links between apparently heterogeneous elements of the drama, Wagner's music makes connections between, suggests and makes connections between apparently separate elements of the story. I find that something roughly similar happens in Die Meistersinger, and that it amounts to a structural analysis not of myth, but of the psychosocial patterns of libidinal discipline set in, a, in the symbolically loaded imaginary locale of 16th century Nuremberg. So let me try to sketch out a few of the latent connections that are articulated by the music, that are suggested by it, even when they are not explicitly spelled out. I want to return for a moment to the first pages of the opera. 
we can grasp more clearly the origins and the nature of this crucial motif here. It is foreshadowed in the prelude, but, but um, m far more telling is its appearance very shortly after the curtain has risen, but before any one character has sung. It appears in a highly significant way between the phrases of the chorale that is being sung by the congregation. This knowing bit of music, led by the solo viola, offers us a glimpse into Walter's subjectivity here at the start of the opera. It juxtaposes the collective of the community singing the chorale with the immediate will of the solitary stranger who has just arrived and is captivated by the sight of Eva. This glance and the feeling of attraction and desire that lies behind it is an impulsive response on Walter's part. This is presented as a moment of immediate desire that is prior to any socially sanctioned modes of affect, interaction, and expression. As such, it is in some sense pre-social, seemingly instinctive, and by the standards of the time, not entirely respectable. The codes and mores of disciplining the instincts, or speaking psychologically, the mysterious processes involved in sublimating libido is at the heart of the bourgeois experience. And this ultimately is what Walter must master if he is to succeed. Sublimation is defined as the psychic development by which instinctual energies are discharged in non-instinctual forms of behavior. The classic instance involves libidinal impulses transformed by being unconsciously channeled into forms of, of realization that are socially and consciously acceptable. This is important because this force, these forces are extraordinarily powerful, but also potentially dangerous. So much so that, in a sense, both enculturation and psychological development are concerned with sex successfully regulating, cultivating, and disciplining this libidinal energy in ways that ensure creativity and vital activity while they maintain social order, family structures, and the like. For example, we can witness something of the progress of Walter's socio-psychological socio bildung in the crafting of his prize-winning song and the triumphant performance of it um, at the end of the opera. Early in the third act, Walter comes to Sox with the idea for a song that came to him in a dream. Even before they get down to work, Sox offers a little homily that is remarkably revealing in this regard. The reference of his, rele of his um, the relevance of his reference to married love, his clear allusion to Walter's spring song, not to mention his use of the term trieben, which was later adopted by Freud, seems clear. His comments about the troubling, oh, sorry about the format there. His um, comments about the troubling quality of Walter's untutored song from the first act are even plainer. I think, I think all the words are there. Walter already understands much of this as, as his new song shows. Now the stylistic outrages of his first song are tempered, if not entirely gone, as is the prominent use of the diminished fourth. So here is the opening phrase of that song. But consider this song, this phrase from um, the next stanza of the song. Subtly veiled by an appoggiatura, which does much to much to help turn this 
into a phrase of lovely, if rather conventional, operatic expressivity lies the interval of the diminished fourth, which you can see here between this G sharp and C natural is a diminished fourth, as is again between the C sharp and F. But rather than presenting it directly, there is this very um, effective, as I said, um, appoggiatura that somehow veils that interval. <laughs> And now, the, now, unlike the first act, um, the words are much more in line with the norms of gender and propriety that Walter is internalizing. He tenderly lauds Eva as the lovely woman standing by my side. Obviously, a totally different and far more socially aware frame of reference than the seething and swelling surges he sang of earlier. Here, then, we have evidence, we hear evidence, that Walter has t learned his psychological lesson bourgeois sublimation, as well as his musical ones. The stuff of raw instinctual drive is there, but it is now not right at the surface, not totally exposed, but processed, subtly transformed. Perhaps we could even say sublimated. How am I doing for time here? I'm okay. Um, Walter's internalization of the libidinal regulations of the bourgeoisie, as well as the guild's rules of verse and song, is vividly demonstrated during his performance of the prize song on the festival field in the final scene of the opera. Moments after Walter starts his song, Kotner, who is overseeing the event, drops the lyric sheet that Walter had given him. Seeing this, Walter is empowered to diverge as if entranced as the stage direction specifies, from his composed text and improvises a new final line to each stolen and the obgesang. These new phrases lose even the veiled vestiges of Walter's original chromatic novelty, just as they add a gorgeous new modulation and drive his song to its grand, affirmative, if perhaps slightly kitschy, conclusion. The newly minted verses apostrophize Eva in chastely reverent terms, comparing her to Eva in paradise and to the muse of Parnassus. The knight utters these words impromptu, and their spontaneous creation confirms his absorption of the proper code, signifying the propriety now of his ardor. At the same time, the discipline of the guild's craft enables his instinctive musical impulse, which had from the beginning been compared to the natural force of birdsong, to achieve the bourgeois ideal of appearing simply to be natural, when in fact his impulses and his art have become highly disciplined both consciously and unconsciously. While Walter's mastery of song may be the story's exemplary lesson, a number of parallel processes unfold simultaneously as other important characters struggle with their desires and their impulses. These include Zox's acceptance of the new situation, Ava's negotiation of her feelings towards Sox and her embrace of her feelings for Walter, and of course Beckmesser's attempts to fake it emotionally and musically. These developments happen primarily sub-motivically, that is to say they are projected musically by motivic work that makes use of the interval of the diminished fourth, but without treating the lenses gebot motif per se. And conscious of the stern gaze of my chair, I, uh, I'll just give, I'll walk through one of these quickly. Very striking in this way is the scene that follows Zox's fleeter monologue in Act Two. Ava, who harbors a concealed, perhaps hardly conscious, yet palpable attraction to Sox, comes to see him. And in a rather coy dialogue, as, as I'm sure you all know, they tiptoe around the possibility that Sox may in fact be Ava's true match. There's a palpable undercurrent of gentle erotic tension in the scene, and as you will hear, the background music is filled with a gentle yet persistent figure that outlines the diminished fourth, suggesting through music what is hovering here emotionally. And again, I've circled them in the, uh, in the example. As the scene develops, and as Sox accepts in his own mind the reality that Walter is the true object of Ava's affection, a new motif appears that again outlines the interval of the diminished fourth, very, very different musically in its musical effect, and this embodies um, Sox's sense of resignation and, and emotional restraint. Welt euch an die 
nicht mit unnützen Fragen. Nun sagt, wer war es, der Freude und Begehrt? Ein junger Kind. By way of contrast, in the third act, Sox and Eva have another scene together, but now the case is closed. Eva has fixed her desire upon Walter, on Walter, and the leading accompaniment figure here in the third act scene is based on much more neutral inter intervals, on perfect fourth and minor third. There is, however, just a hint, almost entirely sublimated, of the crucial interval just beneath the surface, between the pitches, in this case, of C and F flat, floating just at the edge of conscious perception. You'll hear it's played by the high register bassoon. All right, I'll, I'll skip over my optional paragraph, but I am. Um, th th there's much more that could be discussed and unpacked by following the, appearance, the, the appearances of the interval of the diminished fourth in this remarkably rich score. They're all over the place. It's, it's, really, it's really interesting, actually. For, um, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, one of the most interesting of them involves Beckmesser's music, which uses this as a vertical interval primarily in, a, in both as part of an augmented triad and also part of his, his um, Merker motif. It's quite fascinating as a musical exercise to examine how effectively Wagner was able to weave diminished fourths into the score. The myriad ways in which he brings rhythm and instrumental color, register and harmony to bear pay tribute to his remarkable gifts for musical characterization. Perhaps even more fascinating though is how the series of clues created, often with considerable precision by this magic of illusion, this Beziehungszauber, in effect, psychoanalyzes the drama by revealing its unconscious negotiation of the psychosexual tensions that lie at its heart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure there are lots of people that would like to ask questions and comment on this. Thank you so much, that was really interesting. And um, I really like the way that you're suggesting there's um, a way of distinguishing between kind of these instinctual forces versus you know, socially mediated forces by looking at submotivic work versus leitmotivic work. And mm -hmm. I'm just curious how, how far you think this goes in, in Wagner's oeuvre, because in the, in the Wagner chapter in my book, I talk about um, Valkyrie and mm -hmm something really similar that's happening with the motivic processes in, in that, um, in the first act, where, as you know, the, those, that motivic material doesn't really survive mm -hmm. um, into the rest of the cycle, and it's precisely when Siegmund and Sieglinde are working out this instinctive passion. Um, and, there's a, and it's just amazingly similar because there's the whole spring song that Siegmund sings mm -hmm. and a lot of the same kinds of things I think are happening hmm. there. And so it's interesting to um, think about how he never succeeds in socializing mm -hmm. his feelings. And so that submotivic work, it's motivic, but it's not light motivic per se. It doesn't survive beyond you know, that, that first mm -hmm. act. So I wonder if you, if you see similar things going on in other operas. I, I, I haven't gotten that far in my thinking or consideration of the topic. I, I'm sure they do in different ways. It probably, I think, my, my sense is in this opera, which occupies such a, you know, tonally and harmonically such a fascinating space between, you know, the kind of typical Wagnerian chromaticism and this sort of so-called second diatonic style. It would, within that context, the interval of the diminished fourth works perfectly for this, right? Because it's sort of, it's a, it's a chromatic interval, but it's also a tonal interval and so forth. But, so the specific mechanism, I, I'm sure, is quite different in The Ring or in Tristan or Parsifal, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if something, similar things are happening there. 
Thank you for your paper. Thank you. Um, I, I want to ask you a question, and bear with me because I'm kind of thinking out loud here. Okay. But in terms of this idea of a motivic thread weaving throughout the entirety of the opera, I'm wondering if the diminished fourth isn't significant um, alone as a, that specific interval, but rather as a flavor of fourth. Mm -hmm. uh, the examples you've got in there, da, ya, da, 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 beat em. There's always a perfect fourth right afterwards. Even <laughs> the uh, viola line, the next string, uh, Imitation is a perfect fourth. Mm -hmm. Of course, perfect fourths all over the place in the overture, the modulation from C to F. Um, and then, of course, the augmented fourth or diminished fifth with the um, watchman's horn that kind of stops time in act two with G flat, mm -hmm. turns into the quintet in act three as this sort of timeless reverie and contradistinction to the C at the end where we have this active public um, spectacle. And uh, wondering if that diminished fourth is just one flavor of a kind of ur motif of fourths in general that, that go throughout the entirety of the opera. It could be. I, I'm, it, yes, I mean, yes, of course it is to a certain extent. But it's, it, one thing that's quite interesting is the diminished fourth is an interval which has a long history. And the sort of neo-baroque quality that's here in this, in this work um, may, you know, may be adopting some of the baroque use of the diminished fourth. It's, it's probably a coincidence, but I think it's a fascinating one that the birth, the moment that we think of as the birth of opera, Orfeo's Lament, opens with a diminished fourth. Um, so I think it's, I guess I hear it more as this kind of, you know, traditional chromatic inflection more than a subspecies of the fourth, per se. But it's, a, it's an interesting thought. Yeah, I, uh, this is a variation on, on the um, same question that Matthew just asked you. Um, you invoked um, Dollhouse's idea of the you know, submotivicism, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and you probably remember in, in um, Wagner's music dramas, um, and probably lots of other places, he, he um, suggests that uh, the perfect fourth, in fact, the mm -hmm. descending perfect fourth mm -hmm. followed by rising um, diatonic scale, yep. is uh, kind of the, um, well, an essential sort of submotivic I don't know if he calls that submotive mm -hmm. or not, but it's an, sort of the essential motivic DNA, diatonic yeah, DNA yeah, yeah. of the whole opera. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you get it, um, as again Matthew was saying, in the Meistersinger's March theme, and then the chorale or yep. immediately after the prelude, and, and so on and so on. So I was, I guess, my question is, because um, uh, it's quite, you know, it's quite persuasive your idea of this ubiquitous um, libidinous diminished fourth, you know, treat mm -hmm. motif and, and mm -hmm. it, its work in the opera. But I was wondering, so. If the idea, your idea about you know Walter sort of taming this libidinous urge when he gets mm -hmm. to the prize song, which fits into the whole, you know, mm -hmm. all the themes of the opera, um, could you also read the larger process um, against again what Matthew suggested about the background of the of the perfect fourth um, diatonicism? Uh, could you read that process as as Walter um, kind of accepting membership into this? You know, if we take the perfect fourth as a kind mm -hmm. of emblem of the normative musical mm -hmm. intervallic world, is he's accepting membership into that world, which you know is what happens. Yeah, that's a, y yeah, that's, it hadn't occurred to me, but both, if, both of your suggestions, is, I'm sure, are very good, and it's it's something I should definitely go back and listen to to see if that is part of the process of the you know so diminished fourth being norm normalized into a perfect fourth in some way because yeah obviously the perfect fourth is is the you know sort of the obvious um official meister singer interval the way you know it's the first thing you hear right in the first bars of the of the prelude and so forth so yeah a third reflection along those general lines i noticed that the um, and some of your examples from the prize song, for instance, So Hold on Schön, and also uh, Ich nie gesehen, the outer intervals mm -hmm. uh, can be read, and in, in the first case, G sharp to D, and the, in the second instance, C sharp to G, mm -hmm. uh, yielding a um, augmented fourth or diminished fifth. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to ask if you... Um, feel there may be a connection here. I feel there is some, on some level a connection to a very important complex of material um, related to Vaughan. Mm -hmm. And we know that um, in the genesis of Meistersinger around 62, Wagner had already made a version of Hans Sachs cobbler song in Act Two. Hmm. And he later added to it, made a very important addition, which is the counterpoint the so-called theme of renunciation, which opens the uh, third act. Mm -hmm. um, and that 
a theme of renunciation then is placed in the winds as a striking counterpoint. It's what pains Ava so much when she hears Socks sing the last strophe of his song, connected to his hmm. painful renunciation, also of the prospect of trying out for her hand in the, in the contest, as we later learn. Um, but that also contains in its second phrase a very prominent rising um, diminished fifth, Hmm. Uh, e to B flat, mm -hmm. and has a motivic of expressive affinity along these lines. Mm -hmm. It Int would it's, yeah. hence be on a submotivic level, a dramatic submotivic level, a link to another whole complex mm -hmm. uh, going into Sox's direction. Interesting. Yeah, it's it's you know I I started this project just simply by noticing how many of these diminished fourths showed up in the opera, and then really I've spent a lot of time you know, just sort of literally burrowing into the score, reading through it at the piano, listening to recordings of it, looking for these things. And it's, it's a, it is re really an incredible piece of musical craftsmanship. And I'm sure that this, and certainly these are great suggestions for me to sort of um, further, further pursue as, as, time, as the time comes. So thank you. Can I just make a really quick remark about, I don't, um, hello? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> in the shadows. Uh, I don't have perfect pitch, and so uh, I always use treulich geführt. Um, I was taught that this is uh, for a perfect fourth when I want to know what a perfect fourth is. Uh -huh. uh, to, and so that reminded me of Lohengrin, and I'm, I'm thinking of uh, the marriage of, you know, the, the wedding uh, song there. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I mean, this would, this would be further evidence that, that uh, the perfect fourth is, marks the bourgeoisification of Walter. Hmm. Uh, have you considered that at all? Um, no, but it, but it's a good way. To, yeah, so it's a, it's a, it is a good suggestion. So I will I will consider it. Any more intervals we want to discuss? <laughs> <laughs> in that case, um, please join me in thanking both of our panelists.